Good morning. My name is Bill Edisevich. I'm the Deputy Fire Chief here for the City of Elmhurst, and I want to welcome you to our program, remembering the 17th anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Today is a day of remembrance for all those that lost their lives and for all those that gave their lives. We probably remember this year, the 17th anniversary of all the tragic events and all the heroic actions that were done on that day. I'd like to start the program off with the Elmhurst Fire and Police Honor Guard. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to welcome Mayor Steve Morley to the podium to say a few words. I'm humbled to be here today on this Patriot Day. I want to thank everyone who's chosen to join us today to remember those who lost their lives in the attacks on 9-11. On September 11, 2001, nearly 3,000 people were killed police officers, firefighters, government employees, and civilians in the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center, at the Pentagon, and in the plane crash near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It is these victims and others that we remember today. The attack on the World Trade Center on 9-11 resulted in the largest loss of life by a foreign attack on American soil. September 11th was a wake-up call for a generation. A generation too young to remember Vietnam. We had gone over 25 years without such a defining moment. Indeed, it was a wake-up call and a reminder to the entire nation to remember that evil does exist in the world. To deny this would be naive. We already have an entire generation that cannot remember this attack. Something that happened that they now just read about. I remember my freshman year in high school. I had an English teacher, she's an older lady, and I can't remember the circumstances around it, but one day we started talking about Pearl Harbor. And she had an absolute visceral reaction to it. And for a, a brief minute there, she. For about five seconds, she let her guard down. She was no longer my teacher. She was a human being, somebody that experienced something. I had come to find out later that her husband was at Pearl Harbor. Now, he survived that day, but he had to participate in the cleanup and the defense of our country uh, while over 2,500 of his uh, fellow armed forces folks died. <clears throat> 
I didn't understand her reaction that day. It was just something that I had read about in the history books. The loss on 9-11 was greater than Pearl Harbor. To this day, I recall her reaction in that conversation. After experiencing 9-11, I think I understand her reaction a little better. These flags that you see out here represent first responders. The 403 first responders who perished that day. This is a reminder of what first responders do every day. It's a reminder of the ultimate sacrifice they could be asked to pay on any given day. These flags represent the firefighters going up the stairs at 9.30 at the World Trade Center. Many of them knowing they weren't coming back down. Some New York fire departments lost nearly half their company in one day. Part of our freedom was stolen that day. I used to remember the times around the office that we used to brag about how quickly we could leave our house, get to the airport, park, and get to the terminal, get to our gate. It seems trivial now. These and other freedoms are what we are happy to give up. We're happy to sacrifice to avoid such a tragedy in the future. Now back during 2001, I used to fly a bit into New York, quite a bit. And after the tragedy, I probably flew in eight times uh, in the year after it happened. And it was shocking to see. In fact, it was, it was not notable when you'd fly into New York when the World Trade Center was there. It was just part of the skyline. But it was just part of your psyche, your subconscious. But when you would fly in after, it was a gaping hole. In fact, I'd say about half the time our pilot would tilt the plane so that we could look at what was happening. You could literally see the holes in the ground and for months afterwards you could see smoke. What I didn't know at the time is I was witnessing the ongoing attack of our country. Cleanup took about nine months. On 9-11 and in the aftermath hundreds of thousands were exposed to toxic chemicals asbestos, jet fuel, burning computer parts, pulverized concrete, and a myriad of other substances. 17 years out from 9-11, nearly 10,000 first responders and others who were in the World Trade Center area have been diagnosed with cancer. More than 2,000 deaths have been attributed directly to 9-11 illnesses. The average age of a 9-11 first responder is now 55 years old. That man or woman faces a cancer rate of 30% higher than the general population. Last year alone, 23 current and former members of the New York City Police Department died due to directly related illnesses to 9-11. That's the same number of police officers who died on that day. The New York Fire Department has lost over 180 men and women to 9-11 related illnesses. The FBI lost one person that day, and has since lost 15. Some estimate by the end of 2018, more people will have died from their toxic exposure from 9-11 than were killed on that terrible Tuesday. On December 22, 2010, the United States Congress passed the James L. Zadroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act. It allocated $4.2 billion to create the World Trade, Health, World Trade Center Health Program which provides testing and treatment for people suffering from long-term health problems related to the 9-11 attacks. I ask as you go about your day and you have your where were you conversations that you continue to honor those we lost, the victims, the first responders, their families, and I also ask that you remember those who are continuing to be affected by this tragedy. Let us not forget in the words of writer and philosopher George Santiana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Thank you again for being here. God bless Elmhurst, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Mayor. At this time,
I'd like to call Anthony Cazone from the Elmhurst Police Department to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you once again for being here with us today. 17 years ago, when we think about 17 years ago, I celebrated my 36th birthday over the weekend, and many of my family members are now calling me old. Uh, I feel like I'm far from old. However, 17 years ago, I was in a much different place, and being 18, going on 19 years old, uh, I look back at where I was then, and as uh, our mayor shared, many of us will be sharing our where were you moments today. Uh, I'd like to share a, a personal story about where I was on that day uh, because of where I was in particular with a large city environment in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But on top of that, 17 years ago was a very different time for us in terms of technology, in terms of uh, people, in terms of culture. Uh, in, in particular, technology, I did not have a cell phone 17 years ago. Today I carry two with me at all times. Uh, when we talk about things that have changed in terms of technology, when we talk about airport and air travel, uh, our ways of processing uh, and, and going to get on planes have changed quite a bit as well. Where we used to be able to walk to the gate with our friends and family, we used to take for granted carrying small items such as water or cologne or deodorant, things like that. That completely changed. Uh, we are now forced to pack for uh, trips where we are taking air travel. So what has all of this change created? Has it changed us to live in a world of fear? I think initially maybe it did, but I think it later evolved into a realization that we were vulnerable. And from a law enforcement perspective, uh, it forced all of us on the federal level, the state level, the local level, to change a lot of the ways that we do things uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So everybody's memory is different from uh, the tragic events of 9-11. Uh, for me, being a college freshman at the time, uh, I had no idea where I was going direction-wise. I had no idea where my career might land. Uh, but I had some thoughts and feelings on what I wanted to do as I started a, uh, to pursue a career in law enforcement in my studies. But I went to an English class that morning. It was expository writing. And it was an 8 a.m. morning class. And after leaving that class, if any of you are familiar with downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin Avenue parts the, the sea, basically, in, in the downtown area. It's kind of like the Congress Parkway of Chicago. As I walked down Congress Parkway, uh, as many of you probably experienced as well on that day, uh, I took note that None of the public transportation was moving. The buses that usually go back and forth and back and forth all morning long had ceased. Uh, I saw no air traffic whatsoever. Uh, Milwaukee's notorious for their interchange right there. There's about 18 different ways you can go from the highways. So they have traffic helicopters. They have airplanes uh, coming overhead. And those were not present at all. When I walked into my dorm, the first thing that struck me, and it gives me chills today to think about it, every room had a TV that was on, and I walked into my dorm, uh, and my roommate said, are you, are you seeing this? And I said, w what is it that I'm seeing? And I turned to look, and I watched uh, the second plane hit live. And I asked him, well, what movie are you watching? What, what is this? And his reaction was, this is not a movie. This is really happening. This is taking place right now. So, in the aftermath of that realization, some of the thoughts that I experienced being a college freshman, 18, 19 years old, being a male, was, well, our country is going to go to war. I'll probably get drafted. I didn't have any plans on joining the military. I know some of my classmates didn't have those plans or aspirations. That didn't happen, but I did watch as many of my friends took the initiative to join the armed services. 
and they decided that that was their calling, that they wanted to join the military, and that was how they would serve and do their part. Most of them came home. Unfortunately, some of them did not. From a law enforcement perspective, when a police officer thinks and explain some of the events of 9-11, their first response to everything that happened is not, let's go and get the offender, let's figure out how we can get them. It's more so, how can we make this situation safe? How can we help all of those that were injured? How can we help all of those that were lost or confused? And in terms of how it started to change some of our profession, what did it do for us? What did it change in our thinking? It was a reminder about something that all of us have in the back of our minds as first responders, that we might not come home tonight. Every shift, officers start their day, and they know this in the back of their mind, but they don't conduct their daily operations with that thought echoing, thinking that way all the time. Just like our brothers and sisters in law enforcement that day did not run the other way when the planes hit the fires burned and people needed help. 9-11 was also a reminder to all of us of why we got involved, because we are in a profession that's not just a job, but a calling. For some, it might have been a reason for joining the police force to make a difference and help prevent future occurrences. As first responders, we seldom see people at their very best, usually at their worst and under terrible circumstances. 9-11's events were about as bad and as terrible as it could have gotten for anyone involved. For me personally, why I got involved, I didn't know it at the time, but my calling was in law enforcement. I had double majored in broadcasting and in criminal justice, and just was not fulfilled by simply telling the stories, writing reports, and being on camera, and producing news broadcasts. I felt that I needed to do something in order to help and get involved. Some of the things that we remember about the, the actions of the first responders that day are their bravery, their selflessness, their actions, their teamwork, and the thoughts that they put people first. This was incredibly unique, especially for law enforcement, because as officers, we don't receive a lot of the training and the knowledge and skills that the fire department does when it comes to a massive evacuation or a large-scale casualty event. The police that day could not have expected to know exactly what to do in that moment, but they did everything that they possibly could. It wasn't textbook. It wasn't something that they could have studied for. In police work, you're required to adapt and overcome in order to problem-solve a situation with an unexpected outcome. That adaptation by the officers who responded to 9-11 was truly remarkable as they did whatever they did, as they did whatever they could to help. Some differences now between beginning a career in law enforcement prior to 9-11 and post 9-11. Many candidates now, I'm sorry, many candidates prior to 9-11 signed up for the job because they had an interest. They wanted to be a crime fighter. They wanted to make sure they protected the community that they served. Now many new candidates sign up because others do not. They know the dangers. They know all of the threats that are faced by law enforcement on a regular basis. Those who answer the call of duty, whether it be in the middle of the night, a rainstorm, a snowstorm, etc., are part of a select few members in a civil service workforce who don't turn around in the face of danger, we continue straight ahead because that's our job. 9-11 saw 71 men and women of law enforcement who lost their lives that day doing their jobs. So 17 years later, we always remember and never forget the sacrifices of all the men and women first responders who perished on that fateful day. Their courage, their service, and their sacrifice are characteristics that live on through members of fire and police departments nationwide who regularly execute their duties at the highest level. And for all of that, we say thank you.
Thank you, Sergeant Cazone. At this time, we'd like to call Father Jason Stone to the podium to say a few words. Father Stone is from Mary, Queen of Heaven Parish. Last month I was blessed to go to the, I was in New York and was blessed to go to the 9-11 memorial site. The first time I had been there I was never able to see the towers standing. As I walked up, what first hit me, and I suppose as the son of an engineer, just how my brain works was how small the footprint of the building was and how much steel must have been there to go up a hundred stories into the air. Those fountains seemed so small at first, but when I got up to them and I saw all the names etched in the granite that goes around the outside, I realized there were a lot of people in there. There was a great loss of life. Each one of those names was someone who was lost, and just the sheer number of them, as you look down the granite slab and realize it went around and that there was a whole nother one of those on the other side of the park, the magnitude of the event started to sink in. The more I stood there, the more I realized that those aren't just letters etched in granite. Each one of those names is more than just a name, it was an entire life. People who had families, people who had spent their entire career in those buildings, and people who had dedicated their lives to saving so many other lives in that city. And all of a sudden, my perspective on those fountains shifted from small foundations to gaping holes. It's in reality what each of those holes in the ground that are surrounded by the names of those who lost their lives on that tragic day are holes in the heart of our nation. And 17 years later, that hole in our hearts may not seem so big as we think back. We know now that children only read about this event in textbooks, but for thus those of us who lived it, who saw it live on TV, it was very real. Many of us knew people who were there, who were affected directly, and if not, then chances are we've met people, we've heard their stories. The thing about time, it gives us perspective. How we use that perspective is important. The hole may seem small, but in reality the hole is no smaller than it was. We get the same effect here today as we look at all those flags out there in the park. Each one of those flags representing a first responder gave their life for others that day. But of course we know first responders don't only work one day, they work for years. They impacted hundreds if not thousands of thousands of lives. Their loss leaves a gaping hole in the heart of our country. So we gather today to remember them. We gather today to recount what was a defining moment in our country's history and in many of our lives. To honor them so that as we go forward into the future as Americans, we would gather together united by what we stand for. Always aware that even though we're surrounded by massive oceans, as 9-11 taught us, those oceans really aren't that big in the global society that we live in. And whether we like it or not, there are many out there in the world who would see us harm because they resent our way of life. So we come together today honoring those who serve, and honor those who serve even today to ensure that we might be able to even gather on this more beautiful morning as many go about their lives, the planes fly overhead to ensure that we continue to enjoy safety and we never have to endure another gaping hole in the heart of our country.
Thank you, Father Stone. Many of you may not realize. <laughs> many of you may not realize the effort and time it takes to put these flags at each and every memorial that's held in each city throughout Illinois. There's one individual here today responsible for placing these flags. He travels to many of memorial events throughout throughout the state and spends a lot of time on his days off taking care, laundering, and maintaining these flags so they can be put on display for us to enjoy here today. At this time, I'd like to welcome Jerry Christofferson to the podium to say a few words. These are our flags for the true patriots. We do take them all over the place, uh, wherever we are invited to. But every place we go, it has a meeting. Like today, it was for the first responders who were killed that terrible day. Uh, we were here again uh, on Memorial Day at Wilder Park, and we had 1,600 flags up for the POWs and MIAs from the Vietnam War that are still missing. But going back, it's hard to believe the 17 years have passed. And I'm sure, like it was said earlier, that we, re everybody remembers that. But I want you to remember that how we all stood together and absorbed what happened that day. We all showed our patriotism, and our flag was flying proudly every place. You couldn't look anywhere without seeing a flag. We grieved for those we lost and showed a gratitude to all the first responders as we tried to guess what happened and <clears throat> what they were called to do. When we all helped each other, when we all honored our military, when we respected each other, and we watched ordinary people being called to act in extraordinary ways. There are still extraordinary people called, and they do extraordinary things every day. Each year we talk about our first responders and how their job, they do their jobs every day not knowing what they'll be called upon to do. Their proud family. talk about our first responders and how they do their jobs every day, not knowing what they're called upon to do. Their families learn to live with that fact. Their sacrifices are great. I was a member of my local fire and police commission for 11 years, so I knew all of our police and our fire personnel. And I always told them my wish to them was to have an ordinary day. So once again, I'd like to thank publicly all of our first responders and all who serve our country, we are blessed to have people among us with your courage. I hope you'll all think about the words of our national anthem to God bless America and to America the Beautiful as we, re as we remind, remembered and that we all stood together. I'm proud to be an American. I will never forget 9-11-01. And again, to all our first responders, please, have an ordinary week. God bless. Thank you. As we gather here today to pay our respects to the first responders who sacrificed their lives so that others may live, we should also stop to remember the brave civilians who found the courage to help evacuate the victims who were trapped in the stairwells, under debris, those who provided first aid before EMS could arrive on scene, those who brought food and water to the rescuers working on the scene, and those who helped take down the fourth plane before it can cause even more devastation. 
The flags you see here today represent each of the 403 first responders who died that day. But we could fill this entire park with flags for the innocent civilians who were taken from their families that morning. We as a nation vowed to remember 9-11 and to never forget. On this Patriot Day, I thought it would be fitting to tell the stories of just a few heroes who made a significant difference when they could have just evacuated the building and fled the scene. Just to take you through a short timeline, I'm going to read through a couple of events that happened that day. At 8.45 a.m. on a clear Tuesday morning, just like today, an American Airlines Boeing 767 loaded with 20,000 gallons of jet fuel crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The impact left a gaping, burning hole near the 80th floor of the 110-story skyscraper, instantly killing hundreds of people and trapping hundreds more on the floors above. As the evacuation of the tower was underway, television cameras broadcasted live images of what initially appeared to be a freak accident. Then, 18 minutes after the first plane hit, a second Boeing 767, Flight 175, appeared out of the sky, turned sharply, and collided right into the World Trade Center near the 60th floor. The collision caused a massive explosion that showered burning debris over the surrounding buildings and onto the streets below. It immediately became clear that America was under attack. As millions watched the events unfolding in New York, American Airlines Flight 77 circled over Washington, D.C. before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon military headquarters at 945. Jet fuel from the Boeing 757 caused a devastating inferno that led to the structural collapse of a portion of the giant concrete building, which is the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense. Less than 15 minutes after the terrorists struck the, struck the nerve center of the U.S. military, the horrors in New York took a catastrophic turn when the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed in a massive cloud of dust and smoke. At 10.30 a.m., the North Building of the Twin Towers collapsed. Only six people in the World Trade Center towers at the time of their collapse survived. Almost 10,000 others were treated for injuries many of those severe. Meanwhile, a fourth California-bound plane, United Flight 93, was hijacked just about 40 minutes after leaving Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey. The plane had been delayed in taking off, and passengers on board are already, were already learning of the events that were happening in New York and Washington via cell phone and calls from the ground. Everyone who is old enough to is old enough to remember the attacks against America on September 11, 2001, can tell you exactly where they were when it happened. I am certain that each and every one of you still have the images, many that you see here today, etched in your mind. The buildings collapsing, the dust-covered rescuers working in the streets, the police and fire trucks that were destroyed sitting abandoned, and innocent victims jumping from the top floors to get out of the fire. Thousands of lives were lost that day, and thousands more were permanently altered. The courage shown by first responders on that day will never fully be realized. The police officers, firefighters, EMTs who ran towards the carnage can never be thanked enough. Each and every one of them deserves the title of a hero. What we sometimes fail to recognize is that there were hundreds of civilians who also stepped up that day. If you read any books on 9-11, if you watch any of the television shows that are being broadcast this week, if you scan through the internet, you'll find countless stories of individuals who gave the ultimate sacrifice to help those in need that day. From a ferry boat captain who strategically positioned boats for evacuation, comfort dogs, priests tending to grieving families, doctors and nurses racing to the scene to treat the victims in the street, there were so many people who left a positive impact on that scene. I realize that it is not possible to credit each and every hero of September 11th in a format like ours here today, but I wanted to share just a few stories of those individuals 
who during this country's darkest hours served as a beacon of light, courage, and sacrifice in the service of humanity. New York Police Department Officer Maura Smith was the first police officer to report to the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, when she saw the first place plane strike the first tower of the World Trade Center. Smith was a 13-year veteran who ran into the towers and began assisting in the evacua in evacuation. Her coolness under pressure was remembered by one of the survivors who said, the mass of people exiting the building felt a calm assurance that they were being directed by someone in authority who was in control of the situation. Her actions seemed ordinary, even commonplace. She insulated the evacuees from the awareness of the dangerous situations they were in. Because of her calm, reassuring demeanor, everything proceeded smoothly. Officer Smith is credited with saving hundreds of lives that day, giving her own in the process. She was the only female New York Police Department officer to die on 9-11. She was survived by her two-year-old daughter and her husband. Wells Crowther was an investment banker working for Sandler and O'Neill Partners on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center No. 2, or the South Tower. When UA Flight 175 struck the tower, Crowther also was able to remain calm. Just minutes after the plane hit, he called his mother to let, him know, to let her know he was going to be okay. He then began assisting with the evacuation, at one point carrying a woman down 17 flights of stairs, only to return back to the 78th floor to continue to help others. Crowther had met, made it out of the building and was running back in with the jaws of life to help extricate victims when the tower collapsed. He was 24 years old. Rick Rascorlia, a veteran of the, both the British and American armies, worked in corporate security for Morgan Stanley on the 44th floor of the South Tower. Rick had a fear that the towers would one day be attacked by an air terrorist attack. He had become so convinced that he insisted that his company practice evacuation drills. He started running drills every three months on how to get thousands of staff from the company offices, which covered 40 floors of the South Tower, out of the building as quick as possible. He is credited for saving over 2,700 people that day. Rascorla, who was 62, was last seen going back up the stairs of the South Tower right before it collapsed, and his remains were never found. Oriel Palmer, a battalion chief with the New York Fire Department, was able to single-handedly fix an elevator in the South Tower of the World Trade Center and take it up to the 41st floor sky lobby. Once there, he went on to run up 37 flights of stairs to reach the plane's impact zone on the 78th floor. Oreo was met there by Fire Marshal Ronald Buca. These two men were both experienced marathon runners and believed to be the only two to make it past the site of impact. When they arrived on scene, Oreo reported that there was numerous fatalities and heavy fire conditions. Oreo directed survivors of the impact on how to get out of the building. He relayed essential information to the firefighters on the floors below in an attempt to form a strategy to combat the flames and evacuate the building. He brought comfort to those stuck and injured on the 78th floor by ensuring them that help was on the way. Unfortunately, his efforts weren't enough to prevent the buildings from coming down. At 45 years old, both Oriel Palmer and Ronald Buca perished in the Trade Center when it collapsed. Oreo left behind a wife and three children. When the members on board United Flight 93 realized that their aircraft was not going to return to the airport as the hijackers had claimed, a group of passengers and flight attendants planned on an insurgency. One of the passengers, Thomas Burnett Jr., told his wife on the phone that he knew that everyone on board was going to die. But he said that there were three, of those, three on board that were going to do whatever it would take to do something about it. He said, I love you, honey, and hung up the phone. Another passenger, Todd Beamer, was heard saying, are you guys ready? Let's roll over an open line. Sandy Bradshaw, a flight attendant, called her husband, explained that she had slipped into the galley to fill pitchers with boiling water. Her last words to her husband were, everyone's running the first class. I have to go. Goodbye. The brave passengers fought the four hijackers and are suspected to have attacked the cockpit with a fire extinguisher. 
The plane then flipped over and sped toward the ground at upwards of 500 miles per hour, crashing in a field near Shanksville in western Pennsylvania at 10.10 a.m. All 44 people were killed. Its intended target not known, but theories include the White House, the U.S. Capitol, and Camp David. On that day, a total of 2,996 people were killed in the 9-11 attacks, including the 19 terrorist hijackers aboard the four planes. At the World Trade Center, 2,763 died after the two planes slammed into the towers. That figure includes the 343 firefighters and paramedics, 23 New York City police officers, and 37 Port Authority police officers who are struggling to complete an evacuation of the buildings and save office workers trapped on higher floors. The point I would like to make here today is that there were hundreds of people who became heroes on 9-11, not only police officers, paramedic and paramedics and firefighters, but the civilians who were just going to work like any other day. There is no way to know how many lives each of those individuals saved or how they felt when they realized they would never see their families again. But we must do, continue to honor and remember them by telling their stories. I had the honor of traveling to New York with nine other firefighters from our department shortly after the attacks occurred. One of the things I remember the most was the outpouring of support, patriotism, and kindness each and every person showed for the first responders and volunteers who were there to help them get through this tragic event. From the moment we arrived, we were treated like we were part of their families. The residents of New York posted signs, cheered for us in the streets, handled out, handed out water, and invited us into their homes to eat and sleep. It was amazing to see how the community came together to show how much they appreciated our efforts. I truly believe that it was this love and support that was given to those affected by these attacks what is what helped pull New York to one of their most difficult times. I would like to share a quote which was made shortly after the attacks occurred by Senator John Kerry, who said that we must remember the hours after September 11th when we as a nation came together as one to answer the attack against our homeland. As all of us drew strength from the firefighters who ran up the stairs and risked their lives so that others may live, when rescuers rushed into the smoke and fire at the nation's capital, when flags were hanging from the port front porches all across America and strangers became friends. It was the worst day our country has ever seen, but it brought out the best in us. September 11th is a day that deserves to be remembered every single year, and not because of the events that took place, but because of the people, the people that are no longer with us, and those who risked their lives to do what was right. It is important to remember our firefighters, police officers, office employees, and family members. Even though time is passing and it has been 17 years since the attacks occurred, we will never forget 9-11. We hope to continue this event each year and we know how important it is to our community. I would like to take one moment to thank those behind putting an event like this together. Administrative Assistant Laurel Wolf, Lauren Wolf, City Manager Jim Grabowski, Mayor Steve Morley, Police Chief Michael Ruth, Deputy Chief Mike McQueen, and Bob Tannehill, the Elmhurst Fire and Police Honor Guard, and the Elmhurst Park District. I would also like to take a moment to recognize the retirees from the Elmhurst Fire Department that were kind enough to join us here today. Thank you for being here with us to share in this uh, remembrance of 9-11. As you might already be aware, this piece of rail here was received. It's one of the last remaining pieces of the carnage of the World Trade Center attacks. The, the piece here, the piece of rail you see here came from under the World Trade Center. It is a piece from one of the two New York train terminals. The first station at the site was destroyed during the attacks on 9-11 when the Twin Towers above it collapsed. Just prior to the collapse, the station was closed and, the, and they put several injured and lost 
civilians onto the train car to help them evacuate the area. Our plan is to work with local architects to erect a permanent monument here at Station 2 that people can come to and reflect on to remember 9-11. In closing, I'd like to take a, a few moments today to remember the heroes who gave their lives. Today, stop and read the messages on the boards along York Road. Look at the pictures we have here on display. Listen to all those who have stories to tell about the day and how it affected them. And remember how courageous, selfless, and the true acts of heroism that they displayed got us through that day. Thank you. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, there was a bell that signaled the beginning of the, that day's shift. Throughout the day and night, each alarm was sounded by a bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizens. And the fire was out, and the alarm had come to an end. It was that bell that signaled to all the completion of that call. When a firefighter had died in the line of duty, paying the supreme sacrifice, it was a mournful toll of that bell that solemnly announced the comrades' passing. We utilize these traditions as symbols which reflect honor and respect in those who have given and who have served so well. To symbolize the devotion that these brave souls had for their duty, a special signal of five rings, three times each, represents the end of our comrades' duties and that they will be returning to quarters. And now our honor guard will ring the bell in honor of those brave first responders who has lost their lives. These brave men and women have completed their tasks, their duties are done, and they have given their best. For our fallen brothers and sisters, remember their last alarm, 555. Five, five.
At this time, Father Jason Stone will offer a benediction. Let us bow our heads and open our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> o oh God of love, compassion, and healing, look on us who gather here today. We ask you in your goodness to give eternal light and peace to all who died on 9-11. The heroic first responders, our firefighters, police officers, emergency service workers, Port Authority personnel, and all the innocent men and women who are victims of the attacks. We ask you in your compassion to bring healing to those who suffer from injuries and illness from that day. Heal too the pain of still grieving families and all who lost loved ones in this tragedy. Give them strength to continue their lives with courage and hope. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of the earth. Turn to your way of love those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. God of understanding, we seek your light and guidance as we confront such terrible events. Grant that those whose lives were spared may live such that the lives that lost there may not be lost in vain. Comfort and console us, strengthen our hope, and give us the wisdom and courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign among nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. In closing, I just wanted to thank a few additional people for taking time out of their day to join us here at this event. Alderman Mike Conquest, Senator Tom Cullerton, and the young man sitting behind the Senator, Travis Hall. I just wanted to share with you the effort and dedication that this young man has given to those affected by 9-11. Years ago, he started to raise money so he could send, send it to the families who were affected. He sells stickers and bracelets honoring firefighters and police officers who died in the line of duty. Each year, he invites firefighters and police officers from the surrounding areas to a fire station and sets up the catering, goes door to door looking for donations to help make sure that they eat well and have a chance to, to, to vent and, and relax that day. So Travis, if you wouldn't mind just standing up for one second, thank you for what you do. This concludes our ceremony today. Please take time to look at the pictures, coffee, refreshments are in the station. If you have any questions, feel free to go up to one of the firefighters and ask. Honor Guard, dismissed. Thank you.